So, yeah. yeah. Good morning, Bay Area. Good morning, Bay Area. And uh, good afternoon to the East Coast. Good afternoon to Europe. And welcome to our VR Air Association online event, our fireside, about, fireside chat about smart classes. We're happy to host that online event today. Uh, my name is Dirk Schumer. I'm the chapter president of the VR Air Association in the Silicon Valley. I'm also the CMO and president of Reflect an enterprise augmented reality startup based out of Sunnyvale and Munich in Europe. And I'm in the, in the AR sector since uh, almost 10 years, wrote two books about that. Um, and um, smart glasses is of course a topic that is highly interested, uh, highly interesting to all of us. There, there happened a lot, there will happen a lot. And, uh, and that's why we'll talk about that today. Before we jump into that, I would like to give you a quick introduction uh, about what is VR Air Association, what are we doing uh, in our Silicon Valley chapter, what are we doing on the global side, uh, and then also to, to uh, introduce our team quickly. Um, Pete is our host, so when you hear Pete next, uh, th that's the guy who is helping with the slides. Thanks a lot, Pete. So um, I wanna say thank you, of course, to my team that's the Silicon Valley team. These guys organized all of that. I'm just representing here. Uh, so thanks to, to all of you, Marv and, and Frankis, who worked on, on all the, the invitations and uh, sent out that blast. Uh, Peter, as said, is our host today. Uh, he's also recording the session. So that will be online as all of our events will be, uh, will be online on YouTube to watch that later on. And then we have also Victor on the call who is uh, looking for our partnerships. We have Chiu on the call uh, who is looking for our students and university relations. Fantastic team. And if you are based out of the Bay Area and you, you really wanna move the needle in the XR industry, uh, then join us. And the way you can do that is of course, uh, you can follow us on Twitter, uh, which you can see in the Twitter handle here. Uh, as said, we have a YouTube channel. You can see all of our videos there from, from previous events, really great panels there. Um, and uh, we have our website on the, the rara.com slash Silicon Valley. And we have also a meetup page. So a lot of possibilities to join us. And, and of course, uh, you can also become a member. Uh, then you're even closer to us and you could uh, join our team here and to support us also, um, learning about how to organize these kind of events, join our XR community in the Bay Area. Uh, and of course, benefit from all of these things you see on the screen right now, which is really, really a lot. Um, and, I'm, and I'm also happy uh, since I've seen it on the channel here in the chat uh, that our global director, Chris Colo is also on the, on the line here, uh, which is perfect. Uh, and we have really a lot of things in now, especially during COVID. Uh, where you're not where you're not able to to visit on-site events, um, you, we can really benefit from all the stuff we have produced in the past, and the different chapters and committees. Uh, we have a lot of training uh, for XR, uh, so there is really a bunch of material uh, where you can get used and, and get familiar with with XR. Um, we have a, a limited offer for uh, new members. So if, you, if you're fast uh, and you decide quickly about becoming a member, you get a 20% discount. So use that, don't, don't miss out. And uh, Peter, I think you can go to the next one. Perfect. <clears throat> and that's great. Uh, that's the next thing. You don't even need to be a member yet. Uh, you can join our global summit for free. Uh, it's a huge uh, event from uh, June 1st to June 3rd, and it will happen everything online, dial in uh, and uh, watch the, the great sessions. All the leaders from the AR, VR, a space are there uh, presenting and sharing their thoughts, experiences, and ideas. And that's, that's really, really a fantastic event. Can I highly recommend that. All right, Peter, do you have the next for me? Awesome, perfect. So um, we wanna jump into the topic and what we're gonna do is um, we will have a, a first quick introduction 
and uh, then we jump uh, into our fireside chat and then we have a Q&A. So feel free to ask your questions uh, through the Q&A channel here. So not the chat, please through Q&A uh, that we can see your questions. And uh, it's very easy that we will pick them. Um, as I said, smart glasses, I mean, what is more fascinating than smart glasses? I remember when I had the first, the first Google Glass years ago, and yes, of course, you will now remember glass hole and all of these things, and Ben is already laughing about that. Uh, however, it was for me a great experience to, 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 to realize that. And then on that journey, I mean, we lost a couple of companies, right? Uh, ODG, Meta, Dacry, which showed us, hey, it's not that easy. Uh, to build these kind of uh, smart glasses and it requires also money. Uh, others with promising visions like Magic Leap uh, with, with a great potential and then others are already arrived in the market like the HoloLens, uh, Realware or Vosix, uh, now Unreal coming. So there's a lot going on. And um, I'm, I'm very, very proud today, <clears throat> excuse me, to have uh, my good friend, Ben Delaney with me. Um, I think there are not many people in, uh, in that field, in the XI industry, with his experience and knowledge. And uh, he just uh, released his brand new report about smart glasses. And I'm happy that we're very early before it's really publicly um, available and, and, and sponsored uh, to talk about that today. So Ben, that's your stage to introduce yourself and then we jump right into it. Well, thank you, Dirk, and uh, let me repeat uh, his greetings. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending where in the world you are uh, signing in from. We really appreciate your being here. Um, as Dirk was saying, we've just put out a report on smart glasses because we think that this is one of the most important technologies uh, that's coming down the, the, the road for people involved with XR. Let me give you a quick uh, back, uh, a quick little understanding of my background. I've been involved with XR since the 90s when I published a newsletter on virtual reality called CyberEdge Journal. Uh, in the, around the 2000s, I was publishing a, a very extensive market report called the Market for Virtual Reality and Visual Simulation. Uh, we don't use those terms so much anymore, but the technology has continued to advance. And uh, we started Immersive Edge Advisors, my new company, in October. And uh, one of our earliest projects has been the uh, Smart Glasses Roadmap that I and my uh, very able uh, chief data analyst, Natalie Yue, put together uh, and released uh, earlier this month. Um, this report addresses the, just the hardware of smart glasses and augmented reality. We don't get into the software in this report. Uh, we probably will in a later report, but we restricted it to that. You have the next slide, Pete. We're going to give you just a quick run through of, of, of what uh, some of the findings of the report before uh, Dirk and I have a sort of a free form conversation. Uh, as we all know, AR is becoming more and more commonplace and we suspect, uh, and, and we were talking earlier about the possibility that this lockdown and the current um, unsettled situation due to the uh, COVID virus might cause even greater demand for augmented reality as people can't get out and get together as much. Um, we define smart glasses as essentially the HoloLens 2 capabilities in the form factor of a pair of Ray-Bans. The closest we see to that right now is probably Enreal or Vuzix or North. But those are all uh, devices with limited capability, though they are breaking the trail for us. We found in our report that uh, the, the biggest challenges are displays and power supplies, and that those are going to have to improve a lot to enable the smart glasses that we are seeking to actually happen. We also found that we expect 2023 to be our first million unit sales year, though um, as we'll talk about a little bit later, we are uh, expecting to revise our uh, statistical calculations 
to take into account the impact of this uh, worldwide pandemic. And we see 2030 that smart glasses as we are uh, identifying and defining them as a target uh, first start to, to start to be commonly available and revenue in the industry, hardware only again, will exceed 33 billion. Wow, we're getting some feedback there. Um, okay, can we get the, um, the next slide, please? Thank you, Here, uh, Pete. Here are some of the, the applications that we see smart glasses being used for. I don't see there, I don't believe there are too many surprises here, but we were, we were a little impressed as we started putting together this list at how many applications we could imagine smart glasses making a serious Im, uh, impact on. Um, you know, and I think uh, as we said that the the pandemic is going to push this more quickly as people realize that they need better ways um, to connect uh, augmented reality uh, on mobile devices, tablets, and phones is going to be uh, the entry point for many people and is what people are using in many industrial uh, applications already and what we've seen in things like Pokemon Go. Um, Dirk and his company are, are pushing AR to uh, industrial and enterprise users, and I'm sure he'll have some interesting insights on that. But we expect it to be uh, a very ubiquitous technology, uh, and as smart glasses improve and become more available, we expect them to really take off. Next, please. So here's our, our estimate of shipments by sector starting last year where there were uh, just a few thousand units sold. Um, but by 2025, we ex expect the total sales volume to, to be over 8 million units. And by 2030, 80 million units. Um, now this, is, this, this creates that 30 odd billion dollar marketplace for hardware alone. And you see that um, the enterprise sector continues to lead the personal sector throughout this decade because there will be uh, a greater return on investment in enterprise, though we expect uh, significant personal usage. As you see, we've got almost 34 million units sold annually for personal use in 2030, though the enterprise sector is still considerably larger. All right, next please. And then this is the revenue chart and you see the, the enterprise revenue is even larger proportionally than the enterprise units. And that's because we expect enterprise units to be more expensive. The reason for that being that a lot of them will be specialized for enterprise applications. For example, even today you can buy uh, a HoloLens built onto a hard hat for uh, applications and industrial usage. So those kind of systems will cost more than the personal systems. They'll be more rugged, they'll have more capabilities and, and enterprises will be willing to pay more because the return on investment that they get from augmented reality and smart glasses is going to be quite large. Next, please. So as we said, the HoloLens 2 capabilities and a, a sleek and, and fashionable form factor is what we expect to see. And we expect that to be fully available by 2030. We expect by that time that smart glasses will largely be replacing smartphones and smart watches because they'll be so much easier to use. You won't have to hold them in your hand. And so especially in industrial uses where people need to have both hands free, uh, smart glasses are gonna be the obvious choice. Now, the, the, the main issues that really are important to, to allow us to reach this point uh, are these ones that we have listed here. We need to dramatically improve our power supply capabilities. 
And that's gonna happen in two ways. One is that batteries and other power supplies will get better. And the other is that the power draw of the computers and sensors and radios in the smart glasses will all go down as we find ways to make them more efficient. We also expect by 2030, 6G bandwidth. We're talking about 5G now, but in 10 years, 6G will be coming out. And that's going to make it possible to use edge computing and cloud computing to provide incredible power to smart glasses. So that smart glasses will be a wearable computer that will be as, at least as powerful as our most powerful desktop workstations. All the AI graphics and big data coming from the cloud will be displayed in color uh, 3D displays uh, and, and even much of the graphics will be uh, performed in the cloud along with uh, all the other, a lot of the other computing. We expect a variety of designer styling to appeal to computers. Uh, and as I said, enterprise users will have specialized systems that are rugged and provide capabilities that are tailored for the jobs. Next, please. So, we appreciate uh, you being here. If you wanna get in touch, here's our contact information. And as a thank you for uh, joining us in this uh, fireside chat, we also have a discount code. So if you would like to purchase our report, um, bring this code with you and uh, you'll have uh, a discounted purchase price, which we uh, are happy to be able to offer. So that's what I have to say right now. Dirk, what, what, what do you think? Well, thanks a lot, Ben. That was a great introduction. Um, Pete, if you can uh, um, stop sharing and then uh, people can see us, that would be great. Um, so yeah, great introduction, Ben. What I would like to do is I would like to start with the future before we come back. So here we are. Um, I would like to start with the future a little bit before we before we come back to the day. So, because we always ask about, you know, what's the what's the killer use case, what's the killer app, and all of these things. So, I, so my personal question to you uh, now: Imagine we are in 2030, um, and we have that. Would you describe that that Ray Ban form factor? What would you use smart glasses for? What would be your typical use cases? Well, I'm, my sense of it is that uh, for, for personal use, navigation is going to be one of the biggest advantages so that the way we now use Google Maps on our phones, we'll be able to use uh, similar tools, but it'll be presented on smart glasses that provides registration uh, or alignment between the virtual and the real world so that uh, if you're in a if, if you're driving or if you're walking, uh, riding your bike, whatever, you'll be able to see uh, a map that directs you where you want to go. That'll probably be accomp accompanied by voice instructions because uh, voice IO is going to be a big part of smart glasses. Uh, you don't want to be always touching them and, and adjusting things physically, especially if you're driving or on a bicycle or doing something like that. Most of the IO I expect will be voice operated. And so you'll be able to say, for example, um, I'm going for my morning ride. I wanna go here. And after I've gone five miles, I wanna stop for coffee and a pastry. Where, where's the best way to do that? And it'll all be displayed on, uh, on the glasses. Um, I also think there'll be a lot of entertainment applications. I think Pokemon Go showed how much fun it can be to play games uh, in an augmented environment. Um, you know, that was the, the first million user augmented reality experience. And, um, you know, people discount it, but uh, as, as, as just being a game, but it, it showed millions of people around the world what augmented reality can do. And those capabilities are only improving day to day. Um, in the in, in other applications, will be including telemedicine, uh, virtual chats. Um, you know, 
educational and training applications. There's, there's just so many things that you can imagine where augmenting the real world with, with data or, or even just decoration uh, will be desirable. And then of course, when you move to the industrial um, applications to enterprise applications, the list gets even longer. Uh, I think the most popular one, at least in the near term is gonna be remote assistance where you have essentially someone looking over your shoulder because the, the, the smart glasses are expected to include cameras, which will enable you to share what you're seeing with someone else. So imagine a mechanic who is asked to repair a machine that they've never seen before. That mechanic can um, call up assistance and say, um, ask the remote expert who can be anywhere in the world and point and say, hey, here's, a, here's a, a problem with this machine. I think it might be this component. And the remote assistance, uh, the remote assister or expert might, might then circle on the, on the image and say, no, it's not that, it's this one. Turn this nut a half, uh, a, a, half a, a turn clockwise and that's gonna adjust the machine. So I think, uh, I think there's, there's gonna be hundreds of applications and many of them we probably can't even imagine now that the technology will spawn new ideas. I mean, who would have imagined Facebook 30 years ago? But, uh, you know, we're going to see things like that coming coming online. Yeah. Um, I want to ask another one on, on, on that topic, because I'm also seeing a little bit uh, what kind of questions are popping up. I see a little bit the direction where they are going. And we'll have a Q&A session uh, uh, at the end, but I just want to see what's the trend here. So right now, when you see, we have kind of two different diff different areas. We have the monoscombi classes, so things like what we, what we have from Readware and from Wizix. But also then we, we, we have the kind of the, you know, fully, fully, uh, fully powered device like the HoloLens or also what Magic Leap is aiming for, full uh, 3D representation. Now, you, you're saying we take the HoloLens and, and kind of bring it down to the, to the Ray-Ban. What kind of, what, what's for the next years? Where do you see that trend going? Remote is something you mentioned. There, I see at least right now, many companies prefer to have a, a monoscopic device just because it is smaller, it's lighter, it's not, it's not that big, it's not that, you know, form factor is, is, is different. Um, where do you see that? Is, is it more the, the monoscopic or is the expectation that we have stereoscopic and really full 3D? I, th I think the ultimate goal is full 3D stereo color displays but it's gonna take time to get there. I don't think anybody would prefer a monoscopic H, uh, head up display type system like, um, like the ones you were talking about if the others were available at a reasonable price. You know, it's like, which would you rather have a HoloLens or the Google Glass, all the other things being equal? Well, there's no question in my mind, I would rather have the HoloLens. But um, when you, see what you can get at any given price today and the, and the capabilities, including runtime, you know, how long do the batteries last? If, you, if you're trying to, to use um, augmented reality in an enterprise situation, you, you, you need a reasonable amount of battery life. And that's why the Google Glass type of display is appropriate because it doesn't take nearly as much power to run as the HoloLens does. Um, the HoloLens has got a really big battery in it. And that's part of the reason it's such a bulky system and, so, and part of the reason it weighs so much. And then, but then you've also got the, the Magic Leap type solution where they've got a separate battery pack and control system. Uh, and I think that that's gonna be very popular around mid-century when we get to the point where um, you can get everything except the hot, the computing and, and electrical power into the small form factor. So I, you know, my sense of it personally, and we don't have any data that, that can back this up. So take it with a grain of salt. But my, my personal opinion is that uh, we're going to see an evolution 
that leads us to the HoloLens capability by 2030 in smart glasses. And in between there, there'll be a number of options. Right now, the HUD type display, and by that I mean no graphics, just, just data displayed. And this is what you see on some car windshields now, what you see in Google Glass. Um, I think that's going to be very useful and very popular, especially for uh, enterprise users through the decade. But as the, as the capabilities increase, people will move more to the full featured systems. Yeah, it makes sense. But you, you touched an interesting, an interesting point, and I would like to come back to that because you also mentioned that in your report. Um, <clears throat> there, er, there's always a discussion about, you know, can I have all of that functionality in, in, in my glasses? Or do I take some of the components and have them in a, in a kind of an external battery pack or whatever it, it, it contains, or it is the computing unit only or the battery? Um, how, how do you, did you find, did you find anything about that? Where are people tending to, what's, what, what makes technologically more, more sense? Um, you mentioned that in contacts with the, with the 5G, uh, with these little kind of devices. What, what, what were your findings in the report about, um, does it make sense to have these kind of battery packs or, or do people want to have fully integrated smart glasses headset? Well, the answer to that is yes. Uh, people want the full integrated system, but we just can't do it yet. I mean, that's why Magic Leap and, and um, Enreal have, have external power. That's why we expect that the Apple glasses, which we uh, think are now going to come out in 2023, um, will, will link to the smartphone, that they won't be a complete standalone unit because it, we just don't have the technology yet. And, and when we looked at uh, you know, at the challenges. In our, in our report, we list a number of challenges um, that are necessary to, to overcome, and power is the, is the second most important. Um, display systems being the most important, that people want really high quality displays, they want 4K per eye, uh, they want um, occlusion, a really important uh, feature that makes augmented reality seem more real. They want stereo, they want 3D graphics. Uh, we've got systems and they want brightness. Brightness is perhaps the greatest fall, uh, a problem with the HoloLens is that um, while it has a, a good quality, image quality, the brightness is nowhere near good enough. Uh, the other, the other uh, feature that we think people are going to want is the ability for the displays to become opaque so that you can use smart glasses for virtual reality as well as augmented reality um, when you care to. Um, so we don't see much resistance now. Uh, when we talk to Enreal users and Magic Leap users, the belt pack is not the problem. Nobody, nobody's bothered by that. Um, you know, it's just like a lot of people still wear wired head uh, earphones. Um, there's some advantages to it. Um, we expect uh, that we'll soon see uh, wireless tethered systems. And by that, I mean, it'll use Bluetooth to connect or, or Wi-Fi to connect to the belt pack instead of a wire. That'll be another interim step to a, a fully uh, self-contained system. But I don't, um, I don't see that that's a, that's a deal breaker in any way. I mean, it's really a matter of, of the capabilities that the, the viewing system provides. Uh, the belt pack is not, I don't see it as a problem. Do you have, I mean, you, you deal with a lot of industrial customers. What have you seen? Um, it's a good question. It's very different. I mean, there, there are people, they just want to have everything um, integrated because they say, well, look, uh, in our production, for, for example, it's not allowed to have any kind of external uh, uh, battery packs or, or wired devices. So th this can be a limitation, um, but especially when it comes to battery life, uh, most of the people accept to have an external box or device uh, in, in, in order to, to avoid charging all the time. So I would say it, th there is no, no clear trend, but I think it comes back to what can I have with it was what you said. If I can have 
uh, full 3D stereo, um, great quality, good battery life. And, and then in order to get that, I have that, that battery pack. Well, I probably accept that. Um, and uh, right now I think it's still, we're still not there that even if you connect your battery pack, you still don't have that. But there is no, there is at, at least from, from what we see, there is no, no clear trend um, to say, well, 80% uh, would accept that uh, yes or no. It's, it's also why I asked the question about the stereoscopic and the monoscopic devices. It, it sometimes of course depends on, on the use case uh, and what you want to achieve with it. Um, well, that leads me to, to, uh, to another question. Um, now, when we, when we assume that we have a device in 2030, uh, and, and that's kind of the form factor of the Ray-Ban, what you described, do you expect that we wear that every day? Or is it still for you something you wear for a different purpose, like you have your sunglasses, or you use it for work, or you use it for, as you said, navigation? Did you find something about that in the report? We didn't find that, and that's, that's another one of those things that there's no way to collect data on. Because even if you ask people, it's rare, nobody knows what they're going to be doing in 10 years. I mean, if you had asked me 10 years ago if I would have had my phone on me every minute that I was awake, I would have laughed at you. But I certainly do. And that makes me think that people who adopt smart glasses uh, will use them a lot. Um, especially as I expect many of them will, will function as sunglasses. They'll have uh, either um, co constantly dark lenses or lenses that can change density depending on the brightness, uh, you know, like some smart sunglasses can do now. Um, but that, you know, that also brings up the question of adoption. Like one of the questions I saw in the Q&A is, do you think uh, there will still be smartphones in 2030? And, and the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, just like there are still horses, even though we have cars, um, there are still desktop computers, even though most people use laptops most of the time. There are still landlines. There's still television, radio, even though we have television. So usually new technologies do not completely eliminate old technologies, but they take over a lot of the functionality. And that's, that's what I expect to happen. I mean, when you look at our numbers saying that by 2030, there will be 80 million, I think that was the, the figure, I don't have it in front of me right now, pairs of smart glasses will have been sold. That's the total for the whole decade. Now, there are billions of smartphones out there. Um, it's going to take a long time for smart glasses to catch up, even given the accelerated uh, rates of um, change that we're seeing, you know, smart smartphones were one of the fastest new technology acceptances that we had ever seen in the history of the planet. Smartphones might be even faster. I can't guarantee that, but it has that potential. Um, if there were some spectacular breakthroughs, which we, you know, you can never anticipate an unknown technology, but it, but there's some very encouraging technologies in, in power production, for example, like biokinetic that uses the motion of your body to create electricity, thermoelectric, which uses heat to create electricity, photovoltaic, if that became a lot more efficient, the, all, all those kinds of things are things we know about, and who knows? We might read in the paper tomorrow that somebody's figured out a way to do fusion in a teacup and, and now we've got a whole new power source. So um, it's very difficult to predict these kind of trends. You know, we can, we can and, and I feel that our report is fairly conservative. We always try and be conservative in our, in our forecasts, um, but realistic and, and so, I think they're going to be very popular, but exactly how popular, it's pretty hard to say. Yeah. Well, th th thanks to the audience for that question. I also had it here on my list uh, because I mean, the, the title was, uh, the title we have was, of course, provocative, uh, provocative 
uh, to say, well, we expect uh, smart glasses uh, to replace phones. Well, oh, that brings me, and, and we can talk a little bit about uh, about different players because I also see uh, uh, some people asking about uh, about the that the smart uh, smart glasses uh, companies. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have one reason which I would use to to discuss about that and say, well, I don't expect uh, the, 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 the the smartphones and the smartwatches to be replaced. Um, be, besides what we discussed from from history, uh, and, and that's from my point of view, Apple. Um, now we're expecting uh, smart glasses uh, from Apple. Uh, or I know we're expecting also to have kind of a, of an impact there. But why should why should Apple uh, uh, replace uh, phones and, and smartwatches in the next like five or six or eight or ten years until what, what you said the adoption um, uh, is 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 uh, is there? What do you what do you expect from from Apple and what what kind of impact do you see there? Well, I expect Apple to, to improve on what other people have done and sell it for a lot more money. Um, <laughs> they seem, they, it's a good one. <laughs> yeah. And I expect them to sell what people want. If people want smartphones and smart glasses, they'll, they'll still be available. But I, I've, I've never thought that smart watches uh, were a, were a long-term uh trend. I see them as a transitional technology. Uh, and I think in a way they, they bust, buttress our argument for smart glasses. The smart watches mean that you don't have to take your phone out of your pocket. You can just glance at your wrist. But if you look back a little bit, you see that smartphones really hit the watch industry in general a lot. People quit wearing watches. Uh, I know I haven't worn a watch in, in maybe a decade. Well, you do, but that's a smartwatch though, right? So that's, that's connected to your phone and it's, it's a, a smartwatches have largely been phone accessories. So I think that smart glasses do it better, but not everybody wants to wear glasses. So there will still be smartwatches. There will still be smartphones. But as I said, I think that the industry will follow the market. And if the market says, we still want watches, there will be watches. I mean, yeah. you can still buy a mechanical watch, you know, if you want it, if you want one, they're available. I don't know why anybody would want one, but, but you can. <laughs> you can spend a lot of money on that, by the way. Oh yeah. Uh, right, uh, when you have the right brand. Um, ben, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna talk a little bit more about the, about the, the companies uh, behind all of that. We, we touched Apple quickly. Um, what what else in the what did you find out in in your interviews about um, about several of the of the companies? So, do we have or do you do you expect rather a, a big player like Microsoft to uh, kind of uh, own that market? Do do you see um, also a big chance for for the smaller ones? I mean, we see Unreal now, uh, but we also have seen you know. What I mentioned at the beginning, Daiquiri or Meta or Audi Chi, and Audi Chi was not a small company. Uh, but but do you do you see a real chance also for smaller companies for startups there, in that in that business which requires a lot of money? I th I my, my my expectation, and and we go into this in the report a little bit as well, is that. Uh, both small and large companies will be succeeding, especially in the next five years. The big companies have a certain advantage, obviously. I mean, if, and again, we use the smartphone marketplace as, as, as an example. We expect that that provided a, a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the, the uh, explanation for how smartphones will, will grow and take over the market. And if you look at smartphones, I mean, smart glasses will take over the market. If you look at smartphones, you find that at the beginning, there were dozens of brands and they were competing on price and features and durability. Um, you, if you remember, uh, HTC and Motorola were among the leaders and now they're sort of also brands. Um, and Samsung and Apple, um, uh, Huawei um, 
are the probably the the leading brands in the world and nobody heard of Huawei you know in the West even even five or ten years ago and they've they've come on like gangbusters um, they're also to be considered uh, companies like Foxconn and Gore-Tec um, which will make anything for anybody and and they are actually the largest manufacturers of smartphones um, but they don't sell them under their own brands they sell them as apple or you know any number of other brands um, and and we expect the same thing to happen if a small company makes a breakthrough in technology um, what they'll either get bought or they'll succeed dramatically um, it's impossible to predict that at this point because once we one we can't predict who's going to make the technological breakthroughs because there's hundreds if not thousands of, of researchers working on these problems um, and and we don't know what company will come up with it you know maybe IBM comes up with it or Qualcomm um, or some other uh, company Texas Instruments for example makes a lot of the sensors that are in our smartphones and a lot of the electronic components. Um, any of them are capable with co of coming out with breakthroughs, but so are small companies like DigiLens or, um, or the Meta or North or, or Enreal, you know, all these companies, you never know who's gonna come up with the, the, the great idea. Um, so I think for the next five years, at least, it's gonna be the wild west all over again with uh, people competing on features and price and availability with uh, manufacturers uh, playing games um, to keep their prices up, uh, especially the component manufacturers. I mean, our, in, in the five factors analysis that we do in the report, um, we look at, at this very carefully. And, and you know, there's all the, the companies that manufacture components have a tremendous amount of power. Uh, as do the, the assembly companies. But their big competitors, Apple, Microsoft, Huawei, Samsung, um, have the ability to, uh, to, to work around those issues. So um, I expect that um, among the winners will be companies that don't even exist yet or that are doing some very different type of business who figure out how to get into this. Um, I think um, a lot of the, um, the uh, personal uh, use cases uh, will be looking a lot like smartphones in that the carriers will subsidize or finance purchase and decide what, what brands succeed or fail by virtue of who they decide to work with. Uh, I think we see Samsung is succeeding largely because uh, they, they were able to make deals with carriers that, that could not be resisted. Whereas Apple's model was very different. Apple is a company on their own that people want to buy Apple. I think 10 years ago, nobody particularly wanted to buy Samsung by brand, but they started to see them as they went into the phone stores and, and I think that was a brilliant strategy. Um, so I think that's going to happen. And, and I see one of the questions which relates to this too, uh, is there's only two operating systems that really matter in smartphones right now, uh, Android and, and iOS. I expect that sort of thing to happen in smart glasses too. One of the big issues that people brought up, in fact, Dirk, I think you brought it up when we talked um, as we were working on the study, uh, was that uh, a, a uniformity of, of operating system and user experience is going to be really important. That people uh, don't want to have to figure out how to use their smart glasses whenever they get a new set. Uh, just like you can get in a, any car in the world today and pretty much know how to drive it. You can pick up any smartphone and know how to use it. You can you know, sit down at any computer. And again, uh, most computing there's, there's three choices in computing, but there's only two big ones that have like 80% of the market. And that's Mac OS and, and Windows. Um, but they're more similar than they're different. 
you know, we have conventions of how you use these systems, you know, the, what we call the WIMP interface, Windows, um, I always forget what the I stands for, mouse and pointer, Windows icons, mouse and pointer, pointer, the WIMP interface, been around for 30, almost 40 years now. And everybody knows it, basically. If you use a computer these days, that's probably how you use it. With phones, it took a while, but we settled on two options, iOS or Android. I expect smartphones to go exactly the same way, though with what we, with a, a slightly different interface, which we call um, discover, interrogate, ex, uh, and execute, and I can't remember the whole acronym, but it's basically voice operated, uh, and perhaps gaze operated as well, so that you, um, you tell things what you what you tell the system what you want it to do, uh, and it knows more about you by analyzing your actions and habits. Yeah, um, I want to I want to just to mention that I also come uh, for for uh, one minute to to the the impact of COVID. But before I before I do that, um, I I want to I want to mention some of the things here on the on the questions panel. Um, because we talked about the, the 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 companies behind behind the smart glasses, and and uh, one question here is any thoughts on Oculus working on on AR? Is it is there is there any any finding in your report about about Oculus or many others we don't have on the kind of the kind of the radar yet? Well, I think Oculus and Apple are the two. Uh gorillas that aren't quite in the room yet. They've both been very quiet about what they're doing. We can mostly assess what they're up to by looking at their patent filings and their hiring. Um, they're both working on augmented reality. Uh, Tim Cook has publicly said that he thinks that's the future of computing. And um, Zuckerberg is slowly coming around from his prediction of virtual reality in every home to augmented reality in every home. And I think he's wise to make that pivot. So we don't have any more information uh, than most people do, but we do, uh, we have looked at this and we think that um, both of them are, are still a year or two away um, we think Apple is not in a hurry to enter the market. Uh, their habit has been to let other people make the mistakes and learn from them and then come out with something that works better and looks nicer. We expect them to follow that pattern. I see no reason why they wouldn't. Um, Oculus, um, I know, is investing a lot of resources into augmented reality, but uh, they aren't talking to me either. So. I don't know exactly what they're doing, but I expect they'll come out with something uh, relatively soon to start testing the market. And Zuckerberg, by the way, he said years ago that AR is the platform of the future. And then he acquired Oculus uh, as a VR company. Uh, yeah. So maybe it took him some 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 time. I, I see I see something something uh, something else which uh, which interests me here. Uh, uh, changing a little bit uh, between the systems. Uh, there, there's a question also about uh, smart spectacles. But now that leads me, of course, to, to Snap, uh, which has the form factor you want to have. Of course, not the power and not the, 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 the 3D representation. What, do you see a market for these kind of things? Well, they seem to be selling them. They've come out with a, a, a second generation. Um, they've... I don't know exactly why people like them. Basically, they're just a camera that you wear on your face. Um, it, it's it's a one-way system. They don't have a display system. So um, I, I, personally, I don't really see the point. But I think, again, for Snap, it's testing the waters. It's uh, there. They can afford to, to take a flyer on, on something like that. I think they've They've shown us that people are willing to wear uh, a smart device on their face if it looks at all reasonable. I think part of the thing about Google Glass is that they were pretty funny looking and obtrusive, whereas the snap spectacles are uh, a lot closer to normal. I mean, you can still, you can't miss them, but at the same time, they're not bad. I mean, when you look at Vuzix or Enreal or something like that, 
if you don't know, if you didn't know what you were seeing, you could mistake them for sort of bulky glasses. They're, they're, they're close to the form factor. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that uh, Snap is very interesting. I don't think that particular product has a huge future, but I think they see it as a stepping stone to, you know, future generations. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, I will jump around a little bit to, to include the questions. Sure. Uh, There's some, some really interesting questions, and then maybe we, we wrap it up with a, with a question to, to COVID, of course. Um, uh, talking about the standards, uh, I see an interesting one. Uh, so uh, what about standards for AR, and what are your thoughts on, uh, on the OpenXR initiative? I don't have many thoughts on the OpenXR initiative. I'm sure you know a lot more about that than I do. We, I just haven't spent a whole lot, lot, ta, lot of time on it. I think I like the word open. I like the fact that it is a, an open place where people can contribute. Um, I think that's, uh, as we saw with Linux, is a very good way to get good fast. Um, and and it's, in, it's in a leading position, unlike Linux. Linux has always played catch up. Um, but um, I, I, I think it has a lot of potential. Uh, what do you think about it? Are you, are you involved with it at, at Reflect? Um, no, we're not involved, but I, my, my, my feedback is, well, if we're talking about smart glasses that are coming in 2030, uh, I think uh, a standard for AR, specific format AR is, uh, may, might, might be available at the same time. I don't. I don't really see that. Um, yes, there there is an uh, um, an increasing. I would not even say demand, but more and more companies are asking about it. Of course, is saying, "Hey, uh, we wanna we wanna kind of have a, a future proof system so that we can exchange the formats in the in the future." But I think AR is still not at a at a at a level where this is really the the, the deciding uh, uh, argument there. Um, I don't see that as a topic. There we have many other topics around, um, well, when it comes to the hardware about a, what, what, what you mentioned, form factor and all of these things. Uh, not to forget that most of the devices we're talking about are not, not approved by, 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 by most of the IT departments, at least when we talk about enterprise which is by the way, the reason why we have mobile AR everywhere because these kind of devices are approved. Um, so I don't see that as a, as a pricing topic, to be honest. Um, well, that's, that's my, my impression. And when I talk to at least our, our, the companies we have in our field in enterprise AR, um, that's not really uh, something which is, which is uh, really important right now. Um, so can now, I ask a question, Dirk? Of course, you, you brought up IT department approval, and that was a big deal with smartphones and, and laptops. You know, and be, bring your own device drove the IT people crazy, mostly because of the security issues. So we're seeing security as a big, a big deal with smart glasses too. Are, are you running into that now? Are people concerned about that? Absolutely, yes, uh, because that question comes all the time um, about the, about the smart glasses. And, um, and, you know, the, the only reason why it is not, why it doesn't have more urgency is that many of the smart glasses are still used for, um, I don't want to say showcases, I don't want to use that term anymore, uh, but let me say maybe not for a, for a global rollout, uh, just because there are some, uh, some limiting factors and, and the security is one of them. And it takes, of course, time. I mean, we deal with large enterprises. That means um, they have really long cycles, whether it is in sales or in other things. And you cannot expect that they, that they approve, let me say, one, one device type, then they have to do the same after three months before they now know which one is the kind of device uh, matching their, their expectations. So that's, that's very early still, and security is definitely a, definitely a point there. Uh, I've said, and, and that's, that's why I understand that Apple said, or Tim Cook said, uh, mobile AR uh, will, will last for a while. Uh, although, of course, we want to have the classes. Um, well, since we only have a few minutes left, I, I definitely want to come and there, there is a question about 5G and 6G, 5G, 5G and 6G. I'll also come to that. I, I would like to jump on the other one, uh, the, the, 
the, the COVID one, because that it is a topic and, and we, we know there's a lot going on and we talked about it before. Yes, we see, we see a, a lot of requests for remote solutions. We see much more companies coming from the business side. So no, not from an innovation department, but from the business side, uh, testing remote collaboration. Um, now, what we don't know yet is, um, is that something which is now short-term driven by COVID? Is that something which is kind of the, the one-time effect or will that be a sustainable, let me say, behavioral change uh, in, in, in our work style? Um, what's, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's your impression there? Do you think we can expect kind of a, um, of a push for smart glasses now? Is that going to happen faster? Well, I think it's a very complicated environment. And one, one thing I feel strongly uh, is that the COVID pandemic is going to change a lot of things forever. For example, all this remote collaboration is going to show people that they don't need to travel as much. Um, I think that uh, sanitary uh, issues and hygiene are going to be important. We got a, a question here, will, will healthcare and hygiene become a, a killer app? Um, let me say, I don't believe in killer apps in this case. I don't think there's one app that's going to make this happen. I think there's going to be a lot of them. But um, Healthcare is, is a big one, uh, both for telemedicine and also for use in the hospital and, and clinical environment. Um, I think that, you know, in our, we, we've just decided to revise our report to take COVID into account in our statistics, because we think that uh, the manufacturing capability is going to be reduced for several months at least and possibly longer. We believe that, 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 that the logistics supply chain issues are, are going to last for a while. Again, it's hard to say how long, but my personal guess is at least a year. Um, and so, so that supply will be difficult, while at the same time, I do see demand going up for just the reasons you mentioned. Uh, people can't travel. And, and even if they could, they don't want to. You know, I know I'm not eager to get on a train or an airplane right now. Um, I'd, I'd much rather talk to somebody the way we're talking now, knowing that there are no germs going through these wires. Um, that, that works for me at the moment. Um, I do believe that there's a good chance that this time will develop some mobile apps of augmented reality that then become uh, established that people want to continue using them even after the pandemic is passed um, and that will create some pull through the marketplace but uh, we haven't we haven't crunched the numbers yet and my my uh, uh, data analyst Natalie who who's on the call I, I, um, I wish we could pull her in for a moment but she and I will be looking at all these um, issues and, and factors to, to try and create some kind of balance, you know, because there's, there's, there's things working in both directions. There's things that are going to slow the market. There's things that are going to accelerate the market. And we have to do our best to find the most important and the ones with the biggest impact and then balance them out and see what the overall trend becomes. Personally, I think that this epidemic, the pandemic, is going to slow the market by about a year. That's my guess, is that we're gonna to have to push our numbers a year down the, down the road. Um, but we also will need to evaluate whether it creates a larger demand uh, so that, you know, it, I, I just don't know. I don't guess about numbers. I, uh, all I can tell you is I think they're gonna change, but I don't know how much or in what direction. <laughs> we'll know that in, we'll know that in another week or so. Um, since we're running out of time, I would like to to ask uh, one one uh, last question. I know there are a lot of questions here in the panel, and maybe we can take the the, the questions and and, uh, and and answer them after the after the meeting when we send out uh, also the recording. That was also one of the questions. One thing we did not talk about, 
um, not in detail, but I just want to want to want to hear something from you about it. Um, price. What's uh, what's what's the price? What uh, what did you find out about the, about that in your report? Our, our expectation is that the price is, that this this market is not tremendously price sensitive. We expect it to come down quite a bit from where it is today. You know, the Hololens is um, three thousand dollars roughly. Magic Leap is twenty three hundred, something like that. That's too much. I mean, it's not too much now, but it will be too much going forward. We expect the price for smart glasses by 2025 to come down to about $1,200 uh, with enterprise and industrial systems costing more than personal uh, uh, consumer units. Uh, we expect that to come down to around $800 uh, by 2030. Uh, again, with uh, enterprise systems costing more but as you've seen with smartphones, uh, they haven't been tremendously price sensitive. There will still there will be less expensive systems. I mean, even today, if you go on Alibaba, you can find a, a, a pair of, of smart glasses for two or three hundred dollars. You know, they're extremely limited capability, but you can pay a lot more for essentially the same capability um, yeah. by buying a name brand. Um, we think it's going to look a lot like that. The price will come down, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that they become unprofitable. We, we see this as a very profitable business because the volume goes up as the price comes down. And, and as the price comes down, that will be enabled by the cost of manufacturing coming down. So just like you see with smartphones and, and, uh, and, and most electronics, um, especially computing equipment, the price keeps coming down as the capabilities keep increasing. And the, there's, a, there's varying levels that are available. So there's a, like, like if you look at routers, you can buy a, a home Wi-Fi router for consumer use for 50 bucks. You want something to put in your office that can support 100 people at once, you're talking about a lot more money for you know, a more capable system. But even then, that system cost a lot more five years ago than it does today. We see the same trend in smart glasses. Great. Uh, well, it, 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 it is as we expected it. We could talk for hours. We have a lot of topics. Uh, if if and, you don't mind, there's one more question I'd like to address. Okay. Um, this, uh, Vincent asked about voice I.O. I don't know if Vincent's still with us or not. Uh, and whether or not voice will replace hand gestures. Um, I think voice IO is gonna be the predominant interface, but hand gestures will still be useful. I think the Bose uh, glasses that are strictly audio present a very interesting example of what you can do with just uh, voice and, and sound. And I think that that capability will be integrated in the, the smart glasses we see toward the end of the decade. Yeah. Um, but that's one topic, and then we would could also talk about audio and the impact uh, of of, uh, of that. Uh, unfortunately, we are over time, and I I, I don't uh, I don't want to go too far over time uh, since most of the people have other things and other other online meetings. Uh, ben, thanks a lot for your time today. I think okay. uh, we have to do a follow up because we still have a lot of topics, and I see a lot of uh, questions uh, coming in here. Uh, we have to organize that, whether it is online or whether we can uh, come back and to do that on site. Um, I want to say thank you to the audience. Uh, great. Thanks for joining us. Um, please engage with our channels. Uh, we will send out the recording and everything. Whatever you need, please uh, get back to us and uh, keep in mind that we have the Global Summit beginning of June. Uh, so that's, uh, that's also very soon. And I want to say thank you to, uh, to our team uh, from the VIR Association chapter in Silicon Valley. Uh, as always, uh, my great support and uh, it was a fantastic event. And uh, well, stay, stay safe and, and healthy and I hope to see you soon uh, again, whether it is in the Bay Area or whether it is uh, in the virtual form, uh, whatever we will explore. Stay safe and see you soon. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And, and yes, thanks to the team who helped make this happen. Behind the scenes, uh, there was a lot of work going on to make this work so well. 
And of course, thanks for everybody that came and sat in.